CS Science community and welcome to our session on student-centered practices brought to you today by myself, Lacey Eccles, K-12 Science Lead, and some very special guests. So even though we are in a digital setting, we have still got to believe that rich science learning can occur. And that happens in classrooms where students are positioned as knowledge constructors and sense makers. And where us as teachers leverage their experiences and ideas as the class works together to develop explanations for phenomena. But y'all, none of this can occur if we don't provide opportunities for students to engage. And so there are many components to constructing an equitable student-centered remote classroom. And in our previous digital learning channel PDs, we touched on several of these. If you haven't seen them, check them out on demand. Today, we're gonna to focus on two additional big rocks, student ownership in NTI and NGSS assessments in NTI. So that first big rock, student ownership. We know that supporting all learners and particularly those who have traditionally been left out of science means instruction must reveal student thinking from a wide, wide range of students. And to do so, tasks have actually got to be compelling to students, which means that instruction should be built around relevant and engaging phenomena and problems. We know that if students aren't motivated to engage in a lesson, they're definitely not going to demonstrate their best thinking. That second big rock for today is a big one. It's NGSS assessments. And so we know that science assessments designed for NGSS can and should come in all different forms. Really, that's true for all subject areas. And to really help all students develop proficiency in science, they're going to need feedback from different kinds of assessments, maybe quick checks during the process of learning, or deep dives, or authentic transfer tasks. And those assessments designed to tell us how our whole class is doing, or maybe our whole school is doing, or even our district. With so many different purposes and uses of assessment, it's kind of tricky to identify what really sets a three-dimensional assessment apart from a traditional assessment. But today, we're going to dive in a little bit to what research says those components might be, and also hear from some really amazing experts on how they are making these, these happen in their classroom. So let's take a dive into that first big rock, student ownership and equity. And so as educators, we've got to ensure that instruction and assessments are fair and equitable for all students in our classroom and paying close attention to those students who traditionally may not see science as a space in which they are important contributors. In the classroom, instruction and assessments have got to be tailored to the specific interests and backgrounds and ideas and needs of our students. Think about it like using a local community-based phenomenon instead of some that students don't know anything about, or providing students options to make their thinking visible in multiple ways. And so on this slide, you're going to find seven ways that research says a science classroom can promote student ownership and equity. So let's look at them real quick. The first one is relevance, and really one of the most important ones. We've got to provide students with tasks that are actually relevant to them, that they care about, that's interesting, that's related to their own life, or that's globally or universally meaningful. They are surrounded by science, guys, and we've got to find a way to connect them to what they're surrounded by. Different ways of knowing. We've got to encourage and support that there are multiple ways of knowing as avenues for success, not just one way of knowing. We've also got to provide them with multiple on-ramps, right? So we've got to include appropriate scaffolds and on-ramps and cues that help all students connect the task and engage in sense-making. We know our students have multiple different backgrounds, and so we've got to respect and advantage their cultural and linguistic backgrounds. And then we've got to use accessible language, right? Science language often is a barrier to student success. So we've got to use some accessible language and provide multiple ways for students to make their thinking visible so that everyone can demonstrate progress. And then we've got to build up their confidence. We've got to cultivate their interest in and confidence with science 
by valuing their ideas as actual part of the task through connections to maybe their lived experiences or even classroom specific experiences. And last but not least, we've got to provide students with opportunities to monitor and recognize their own progress. And that can look multiple different ways based on what students need. So three-dimensional science standards, a la NGSS, are gonna raise several questions about how we monitor student progress. What does it look like to ask students to demonstrate progress towards 3D standards? Or what are the features that actually make a high quality task? Well, research from Achieve highlights five really important features. And so I wanna briefly talk about them before we dive in and talk to some teachers. The first feature is to be focused on a phenomenon or problem. I feel like a broken record. I'm saying the word phenomenon over and over and over and over again. And that's on purpose, y'all. That's the first thing we've got to be concerned about in instruction, which means it also needs to be reflective in assessment. If we want assessments to really reveal what students know and can do, they've actually got to be motivated to engage in that task. And to support all learners, we've got to choose phenomena and or problems that are rich and compelling to students who are seeing the task. We want our assessments to be reflective of our instruction. Then we've got to require students to engage in some sense making. And this is perhaps the most important shift for NGSS instruction and then NGSS assessments. We've got to ask students to actively engage in sense making as the actual goal of the assessment. So guys, that means the assessment tasks have got to emphasize reasoning as the way students show their understanding of science ideas rather than a rote memorization of facts or a rote memorization of procedures. That's not assessment anymore for NGSS. And then in tasks, guys, sense making happens, sense making happens when students have to apply all of the science and engineering practices, their understanding of those core ideas or cross-cutting concepts. Which leads us to the next one, which is we have to require students to use both science ideas and science practices. So from exit tickets all the way up to final exams. Students have got to be required to use at least one science and engineering practice and one core idea together as part of their sense-making process. But this is the floor, not the ceiling. The more comprehensive the assessment, the higher the bar for what students need to demonstrate, a la SCPs, CCCs, and DCIs. We've also got to make sure our assessments are equitable. They should be relevant authentic, meaningful to students. Classroom-based assessments experiences can be powerful mechanisms to build student agency and identity as scientists or as engineers. And then the last one seems simple, but is one that we still need to highlight, is that they support the intended purpose and use. Tasks have different purposes, right? And it's important that each task is designed to provide some type of evidence to meet whatever that purpose is. For example, we might have a lesson exit ticket and it might focus on an itty bitty specific part of a practice or a part of a core idea or maybe those together, part of a cross cutting concept that was addressed during the lesson. While an end of the course kind of final exam might emphasize students ability to transfer that understanding to new context and use multiple practices and multiple core ideas and cross cutting concepts together. So it's critical that assessments are designed to support that intended purpose and use and that we're transparent to students about what's being assessed and the purpose of that assessment. So if we take what we know about Big Rock number one on student ownership and Big Rock number two on NGSS assessment, we should have assessments that hold true to these four tenets. First one is that they're meaningful. Tasks that authentically connect to students' experiences and ideas are and are grounded in students' backgrounds make them meaningful. Assessments, guys, can be empowering. Tasks that value student ideas, that provide students with choices about which evidence to use or how to go about addressing a phenomenon or problem and provide these real opportunities for students to figure out something that matters to them. Assessments are accessible. Tasks that use easy to understand words. We don't need these big, crazy assessments. Simple sentence structures, they have scaffolds. 
and they provide several ways for students to make their thinking visible. Maybe it's through written language, maybe it's through a model, maybe it's through verbal responses. And then lastly, they're fair. Tasks that ask students to give, that students have had sufficient learning experiences to participate in fully and include feedback that accounts for multiple ways of knowing that students may be leveraging. So that was a lot of me talking, but I have a treat for you. I'm gonna stop talking. Instead of me talking to you about all the different strategies that you might be able to use, we've called in the experts. We have a panel of four teachers from all over our district here to talk to you about how they take those pillars and make them come to life in their classroom and what adaptations they might have to have made due to NTI. So think about the next 15 minutes as a low budget, late night science talk show where our guests might not be starring in the next blockbuster, but they are doing a job that is way harder, keeping a student-centered focused science classroom during virtual instruction. So let's see what they have to say. So if we know that research suggests that personal interest is such an important factor, how are you guys tapping in to students' personal interests in the science classroom? Kelly, you are an elementary school STEM teacher. Do you have anything for us? Sure. So what I've noticed, um, especially during NTI, is that if, if my um, instruction is relevant to kids, they're going to be so much more engaged and willing to continue to engage in the work. Um, I found what's most successful for me right now is in the use of project-based learning units. Um, so where I'm giving kids a problem that uh, they find relevant and then allowing them to guide how they solve the problem. Um, it's really created a whole new level of engagement for me. So um, as an example, I've introduced to our fourth graders the idea of uh, Bowen saves the bees. Our school mascot is the bees. And so we're on a mission to save them uh, and our local population. So I've just facilitated some research for them um, to help them understand what the problems are facing bees. We've introduced them to a local beekeeper and then um, pulled back the reins and gave them an opportunity to express how they want to solve the problem. So um, these fourth grade friends are coming at it from three different fronts right now. Um, you know, I've got kids who are creating or designing and creating a pollinator garden, bee habitats, and a um, Google site to educate others about the importance of bees and highlight their work. And they've taken it so much further than I ever would have had I just planned a whole unit and, and started teaching through it. Well, I noticed very quickly that when our kiddos got back together after this, you know, the, the last part of their fifth grade year, they were NTI. And then they had to start middle school in sixth grade, very nervous, very scared. And so we had some chatting time and came, it became very evident that they were into video games, many, many video games. So we were thinking, okay, we need to get them excited about science and not just hearing the teacher talk to them, but maybe actually interacting with something. So the FET simulations have saved the day. Um, the colorado.fet.edu, is that correct? Yeah. Um, spot so on. for it's us, it's been, fan, it's been fantastic. Force in motion, they were able to actually learn about Newton's second law before we even said a word. They were able to go on and just interact with that program, basically play, right? Play on that digital um, background. And they were able to go, wait a second. I noticed that when I put two men over here and then I put one figure over here, it went this way. So they were actually talking it through without even using the word force, without using the word mass, without using the word accelerate, but they knew what it meant. But how are we taking students cultural backgrounds or linguistical backgrounds and advantaging those in the classroom. Does anybody have any tips or tricks that you've been using? I have a couple that I have found to be helpful for me um, just because I don't know my students as well as I usually would. So starting off the year, I would get to know them and then I would be able to be like, this relates to you because I know this about you and this relates to you because I know this about you. So just taking the time like whenever I start a new unit or even a new lesson and saying like, what have you heard about this idea or this idea or what, what do you know? And it doesn't have to be right. Um, you know, it just has to be, 
you don't even have to believe it. Just what are things that you've heard about it? And then like using that to kind of give me a path through so that I can keep it related back to them throughout. Um, that's one thing that I found really helpful, especially because I have a lot of kids from a lot of different cultures. So there are some ideas, I feel like as a science teacher, I'm like, oh, I'm well aware of all these misconceptions. And then they throw these things out and I'm like, oh, I've never heard about that before. Like I had no idea that idea existed. And so it's helpful for me to get to know the kids and help them connect what, they, what they've experienced to what we're gonna be learning. I just had one quick example. I have a student from Brazil. She is a, a brand new English speaking student. So we're working through that um, many different ways, but uh, she is actually currently in Brazil for until we can, you know, until we're done with break. And so when we were talking about seasons and the fact that whatever happens in the Northern hemisphere, you can predict what's happening in the Southern hemisphere because it will be the opposite. So it was perfect timing that we are entering winter here in Kentucky. And then she was able to talk about how they were wearing their sundresses and, and their flip flops um, there on the beaches of Brazil. So that the kids were like, aha. So it really made it real for them. That's so cool. Yeah, can I right piggyback now. on that really quick? Because I it made me think of something. Uh, I had I give my students surveys about what they what is going well and what isn't going well, and I have quite a large amount of ESL students. And one thing that I have done is on not every slide, but on slides where like there is a really big science idea that I really need them all to know, I'll translate it into every language that I know is spoken in my classes, and I put them in little bubbles on the slide, and so. I've had students tell me like that's really helpful because they, it, it just doesn't feel so intimidating to them. And so that way, even if there are some things that they're not picking up on, they at least can feel assured that they're, they're getting access to those big science ideas. Are any of you providing opportunities for students to monitor their own progress and recognize their own progress as we're kind of navigating these NTI waters or even navigating the NGSS waters? Schooler, you got anything for us? Yes, ma'am. So oftentimes in my class, I'll give students a weekly science reflection and I will either prompt them with a question or give sit and starters for them to use to judge what went well for them this week in class and identify what they truly mastered and maybe what they might need a little bit practice more on. So then when we have office hours, I'm able to invite those students in and give them one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting and even mixed classes and mixed ability levels to really make sure that those students are capturing what we need them to know out of those standards while making it still on topic with what they need. They're telling me what they need rather than me telling you or them, this is what you need to know, which then really makes it cool because it buys into their interest. So they are now seeing that Miss Schooler, you know, care, she's gonna listen to what I need and provide me with that instruction. So I'm not worried about necessarily what score I get. I'm worried with what I can master. So let's look at that second big rock, assessments. Um, big challenge, right, facing teachers as they shift instruction to meet NGSS is how are we assessing it? What does the assessment look like? How do we bring um, the way we're doing instruction over into assessments? And really, let's think about this through two lenses, right? Let's think about it through the lens of how has your assessment shifted a la NGSS? Right, so we have that kind of rock to talk about, but also you might have shifted your assessment a la NGSS, but now you've been asked to shift again a la NTI. So Radke, can you talk to us about either one or the other or both about how you're having to shift um, assessment with your elementary school babies in your STEM lab, STEAM lab, my bad. That's okay, absolutely. Um, even before NTI, just going into NGSS, I found that using uh, Google Forms has been a really great way for me to get a quick snapshot at the end of the class period, um, using it more as an exit ticket where I can see what content they've picked up pretty quickly. Um, and then being able to take that information, you know, as Google Form puts that into a spreadsheet, I can look at trends among the class and among the entire grade levels um, just to see where they are for a quick formative assessment. 
One thing that I would like to transition into NTI and even back into when we go back into the classroom is allowing students multiple chances to show mastery on assessments. And since that is coming down to us from our pride and true leader polio of giving students multiple opportunities to master standards, letting them retake stuff and not necessarily offer them a retake, but okay, you, you struggled with an assessment that was an AB format. Could you tell me about it? Could you come to office hours and maybe you need to tell me about it? Could you draw it out for me and hold it up in front of your camera so that I know that you understand the model? So offering them multiple chances in multiple ways, even though we're online, to see what they can master. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. I think that um, that's a great combination kind of of our two rocks, right? Of student ownership and assessments, multiple ways of making student thinking visible as well as still staying true a la NGSS. What and about high school, Brittany? We, oh, oh, hold on, Q has something to say. Oh, well, I was just gonna mention that uh, for my English language learners, it's very difficult for them, for many of them to actually be able to describe what it is they're trying to say, kind of like I just did. Um, so it's, it's helpful if we set up an actual time that we can Google Meet just, just the two of us or the three of us and we can discuss it. They can show me you know, pictures of what maybe they're meaning or they try to come up with words to explain and they don't have to feel nervous doing that. To unmute. So um, I also, I'm a huge proponent of multiple opportunities. Um, and we did this before NTI as well of having giving students a question and having them answer it at the beginning before we start the, the lesson. And then like we chunk it, like we learn a little bit of new material and now we go back and we add answers in a new color. And then we learn a little bit more and we go add answers in a new color. And so they really get to see how their ideas have changed. And so then we can also provide them feedback so that by the end of the lesson, they don't even have to like fail it the first time and then come back and try it again. Like they are revising as they go. And I've had a lot more success at the end um, if I chunk it. But in NTI, it has been a little bit harder uh, because a lot of times I just use spaces as formative assessments. Like, well, you're not gonna get it because you're not even looking at me. You're looking at ceiling. Um, and so I don't get to use faces for formative assessment anymore. So I've started to rely really heavily on Pear Deck um, and I will ask a question and I, I have them give their answers and then I share some of the answers and we talk about what's right or wrong. And then we learn a little bit more and they give their answers and then I can share those answers and they can pull from those answers to give their own final answer on, a, on their own assignment. And so Pear Deck has been a really good way for me to formative assess without being able to see their faces. Uh, and I've been, I, I mean, it's what I use daily. They just know that they're, all their answers are going into Pear Deck for me. We talked earlier and you've heard me say this several, several times, phenomena, phenomena, problem, problem, phenomena, problem. And so they really have become central to any conversations about um, science teaching, science learning, science instructional materials. And so if we want assessments to truly show what students know and can do, and we really want assessments to be reflective of what they've done in class, then assessments too should likely incorporate phenomena and problems. And honestly, our state test incorporates phenomena and problems. And so how are you guys shifting some of your assessments to be more reflective of that kind of critical component um, of NGSS? I can start on this one. Um, so for STEAM instruction, we utilize the engineering design process um, and it's been a big shift for us. Um, but during the, the first step is ask. And so during that step, that's when I'm doing all those formative assessments I mentioned, collecting those Google Forms, looking at what um, science content they've learned. But then as we move on through imagine, plan, create, and improve, I'm, I'm using that as my assessment. Did the kids learn the science content they needed to learn in order to create a model or a system um, that, that solves the problem that was asked? Um, I don't think that it actually looks much different. Uh, we choose our phenomena uh, 
which there's like a thousand websites out there that have interesting phenomena linked to every NGSS standard you can think of. Um, and so our assessment is really the same. Like we give them this confuzzling phenomena and we ask them, what do you think's happening? And so that can be in a written explanation or that can be a model. And then just as we go through, they continue to revise it. And so I'm assessing them formatively on their revisions, but really that ends up being the summative assessment too, is can you explain it? And can you explain the science ideas behind it? And maybe it's the same phenomena or maybe it's a new phenomena with the same science ideas. Um, but yeah, I think it looks a lot the same uh, at the high school level. What about middle school level? Q, schooler? Okay, so one of the things that, again, looks very similar. Um, however, what I'll just use an example. How about a specific example? So with the moon phases, okay, is it really that, the, the way RPLC looks at it is, is it really that important that the kids can look at a model and name every moon phase? Okay, maybe back 10 years ago that was, but now what we like to do is, okay, kiddos, um, last night we looked up and we saw it was a full moon. Okay, we saw the entire lit portion of the moon. So in 10 days, what do you predict will happen if you go outside and look up? If there's no clouds, of course. And because we like to argue that as well in, in sixth grade. Um, but, but it's interesting to see them try to figure out, they're like, okay, well, each phase takes da da da. And so then I go here, here, here. Oh, that's going to be a waxing or a waning gibbous or a waxing crescent. So then they're actually getting that information. So it's, it's pretty cool. And if they can't name it, they can at least describe it. They'll say, well, I know that the darkness is going to be on the right hand side. And so we've really talked a lot about describing what it is. What are you predicting is going to happen? And I think they kind of like it. It's almost like a mystery game to them, right? <laughs> I think that's what a phenomena is, right? Like it is a big giant mystery that we're trying to figure out. And it sounds to me like you're really having students use those cross-cutting concepts, right? Of thinking about patterns that they might see of kind of that sense-making tool versus um, like what you said 10 years ago, we did used to assess kids on memorizing the phases of the moon. That was absolutely questions on K-Prep. You will not see that anymore. However, um, I think that's a really good point and a really good example to kind of point out that A, you made it relevant to kids, right? So you're taking that first pillar and then B, you're designing an assessment a la NGSS where they're having to use a cross-cutting concept. And it wasn't some big magical assessment. It was a pretty simple, straightforward, like, can you, do you understand the pattern that happens when we think about moon phases? That's a great example. Oh, it has now gotten to the point where kids, when they get online, like right as classes start, Miss Q, Miss Q, I found a pattern. I found a pattern. <laughs> That's fantastic. Tell me all about your pattern. <laughs> our show by thinking back to those two big ideas, right? Student ownership and NGSS assessments. And we know that there's not one, only one ingredient um, that is gonna help students with student ownership or assessment, that every teacher finds an approach that works best for them. However, I do think today we found some common threads and themes um, across K-12, which is pretty a beautiful thing, right? And that's the, that's the purpose of NGSS, it's K-12. Isn't that beautiful? And so hopefully some of the amazing ideas of this panel of instructors will resonate with you and you will take a nugget back and give it a try. And so we really thank you for your time and um, hopefully we will see everybody again soon. Thank you.